Dear Jesse, it's summertime in the Brandywine Valley, and I'm looking forward to meeting you. It's been a long nine months, and Kelly, Come your on. mom, is beaming with anticipation. Over the past winter and spring, I painted every room in the house, sanded and varnished all the floors, and planted blueberry bushes in the yard so they would be ready to pick when you start walking. I even mowed a path through the back meadow so we could go on hikes together. We should probably thank you for finally getting our life organized. We're ready. Well, we think we are. I met a couple of friends for brunch at the Four Dogs Tavern a few weeks back. We got to talking about a trip I had always wanted to take. A trip, as it turns out, that would have to happen sooner than later, as our family was about to grow and free time would be at a premium. I wanted to document the river that had been so important to me throughout my life. The Brandywine River taught me how to swim, how to fish, and how to respect the outdoors and its resources. The Brandy Man was about to take shape. Here we go. Really nice First uh, dip in the water, we're going Mortonville to Wilmington. Here we come. Brandywine, July 2011. Brandy man. <laughs> July 12th came in a hurry. We gathered at our house to meet our team. John, that's me, your dad, photographer and artist, whose adventures have brought me from the plains of the Serengeti to the ice caps of the Arctic. Hoagie, our neighbor, carpenter, naturalist, who had previously lived on a commune and had the stories to go with it. Dan, a banker, whose life journey has landed him in Wilmington, Delaware, where he has learned the value of giving back and providing for others. Steve, my former student and videographer, was an integral part of my trip to Tanzania. Alex, Wilmington native who earned early celebrity when he hit the last second shot to earn St. Mark's the Delaware State Basketball Championship. The Brandy men would be making their way from the headwaters of the Brandywine all the way to Wilmington, Delaware, ending at Brandywine Park. Upon putting in, we recognized the summer heat and long weeks without rain were going to make paddling tough. We spent much of the first mile on more of a trek than a canoe trip. We persevered, stopping occasionally to pick wine berries and watch deer on the banks of the river. These are wine berries, one of the best berries along the Brandywine River. Really sweet. Come in bright red. Got to get them before the birds get them. The Brandywine River has been a critical part of local life for as long as man has inhabited its banks. The river sustained its communities by yielding massive crops of shad that ran up from the Delaware River to spawn. Today, those types of shad runs in the Brandywine are impossible because of the several dams you can see on the lower river. I think everyone recognizes the importance of eliminating those dams, but times are tough right now, and that kind of project will cost a lot of money. The first stop we made was at a bend in the river by Robert E. Lee's property. It looked like kids had enjoyed a rope swing hung there several years ago. We would see several of these swings along the river, just another reminder of the role this river has played in so many of our childhoods. Hoagie shared some local stories about Mr. Lee, and we sat back out on the river to stop a few miles later at PP Beach. Now you have to understand, much of the Brandywine riverbanks are steep or rocky, or generally impossible to access without falling prey to stinging plants or 18 inches of shoe-sucking mud. So when I call it a beach, we didn't expect sand between our toes. Safely on the land, we scavenged some fishing line and a hook from a tree, which you and I will no doubt replace 10 times once you're old enough to hold a rod. We dug for worms and fished a little honey hole, pulling out bass, crappie, and plenty of bluegill. It's remarkable how much money people spend on equipment trying to make a simple, relaxing afternoon as complicated as they can. Just like that. We had a lot of ground to cover on day one, so we decided to pick up the pace and try to make it to the old mill for lunch. We pulled our canoes out before the waterfall and set about making a fire, the Native American way. We used a bow, fire stick, and a plank. I wish I could make you proud and say we were successful, but it just wasn't in the cards. Hunger prevailed and we succumbed to Hoagie's offer of starting a fire the American way, with a Zippo. Dentimore beef stew was as good as the finest cut from Brandywine Prime. With our hunger satisfied, we headed down a path to an old barn. We could see the barn had a broken window, but otherwise looked to be in decent shape for how old it was. Hoagie suggested we climb up the ladder to see what was up there. 
I stuck my head up and came face to face with a pair of fledging vultures. Apparently, this was just one of several generations of vultures who've made a home in that old barn. Not wanting to disturb them further, I made my way back down the ladder and headed back to the canoes. The heat was getting a little more intense, but the sycamore trees on the riverbanks were keeping us cool. We landed at the foot of what we hoped would be a trail that led to Potter's Field sometime early in the afternoon. Now understand, none of us exactly knew where we were going, but we had the general idea. Unfortunately, general ideas along the Brandywine River mean only one thing, stinging nettle. Right here, you can see all the spikes on this. So if you get nailed by that, itch for seven or eight minutes, maybe ten minutes. You can also eat this though, especially in the spring when it's real young, you can boil it, eat it like collard greens. The good thing is it usually grows by this, which is jewelweed. You can just take it, mash it up like this, put it on your legs where you got stung. Always an antidote. This is also good, the jewelweed's good for sunburn, it's good for poison ivy, it'll dry it out. You can eat the seeds after it flowers, and there's uh, two species that close on. We made our way through the thick bush of nettle, briars, and poison ivy to find the railroad tracks that follow much of the river. We followed the tracks north about a half mile and saw the field. Potter's Field was a burial place for the poor. There are several of these around the country. Native Americans, immigrants, and countless other deceased lay shoulder to shoulder in these fields, many marked with nothing but a small stone. Uh, so we're at Potter's Field off the of Brandywine, and um, this is the burial site of Indian Hannah, known to be the last of the Lenny Lenape, the tribe that lived along the Brandywine. And so that's kind of my I was a history major and that's sort of my interest of the Brandywine and one of the reasons that I'm on this trip. And so the Lenny Lenape uh, is an Algonquin tribe and uh, there's three sects, basically the, the Wolf Clan, um, the people who live upriver, um, so Stone Country kind of in the Poconos, um, then like the Turtle Clan, sort of people around Philly in this area, and then the Wolf Clan. Um, living down in the beaches, beach areas of the Delaware. And um, Indian Hannah in the 1800s, she was sort of made her living by trading and walking up and down Kennet Pike. She had a, some of the legends say she had a, a dog that followed her around. She would trade goods with people settling in the area um, up along the route through the Kennet Pike. So this is her resting place. And over here is Potter's Field, which uh, apparently there's a lot of remains of arrowheads and old um, Lenny Lenape artifacts, so hopefully we can find some today. So seven years ago, this is where I proposed to my wife. It was the middle of a snowstorm. I bought the ring that morning and it was burning a hole in my pocket. So I told her to uh, get in the car. It was also her birthday. It was right around Thanksgiving. I blindfolded her. Snowstorm. We hiked out here. Had her hike to the top of the hill and then I uh, opened her eyes and there was the ring and she said yes. Our next stop was the home of Mr. Wilson who shared with us some of the history of how he and his family came to make a home on the Brandywine. He was fascinated by the different birds he has seen return to the Brandywine Valley. We have uh, oh, a scarlet tanager who lives way up, in, they say they're in, in the habitat of uh, the highest tree. We have kingfishers. We have their geese. I told you about. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they're they're wonderful to watch. His daily routine of a short walk to the water, where he and his wife sit and sip a martini in the afternoon sun, keeps a smile on his face as he remembered when the water on the river wasn't so clear. When we first came out here, uh, you people would have missed it. But, uh, as far as Bortonville, used to have these little pipes sticking out. <laughs> a house here, or a factory here, the pipes would come out and everything was really dumped right into the Brady one. Hmm. And that has been cleared at Mortonville, Coatesville cleaned it up and then 
on the way down, the Brandywine Valley Association has been encouraging people to uh, not drain anything, any excess into the Brandywine. So right now, as low as it is, it's about as clear, I think, as, as we've ever seen it. Yeah. As our day was coming to a close, we set off down river to meet some folks who agreed to put us up for the night. Our minimalistic approach to the Brandy Man adventure was put to the test with the opportunity to order pizza and have a cold beer on the dock. We'll talk about self-control in a few years. We awoke refreshed and set out for the final day of the Brandy Man. The Brandywine is a river of life, but as we know, tragedy can strike those with the purest of hearts. In 2009, two priests came over this in a kayak. Each one had their own kayak. And people were on the bank yelling at them to stop, don't go over the dam. They went over the dam anyway. Um, both of them died during the flood stage. Yes, water was just ripping by here. Divers and rescue boaters were still in the water late evening. They're equipped to continue their mission well into the night. Uh, and that's approximately 12 to 13 feet deep. Uh, it's a wide, expansive area. They are taking their time and they are covering the area of the dam. Just goes to show you got to know the river when you're traveling. The Brandywine Valley has been the home of many world famous artists. The Brandywine River Museum holds some of the Brandywine's most famous pieces. This is a museum not only charged with the preservation of these fine art pieces, but also with the conservation of our great river. What would you like to see individual people do to help conserve the Brandywine? Um, get rid of their lawns. <laughs> uh, I think uh, a lot of people aren't aware of uh, how environmental disastrous lawns are as far as not providing any habitat. Uh, most people are probably aware how their lawns uh, burn out in the summertime. There's, they do not have deep roots. If you plant native grasses in a meadow, it helps the water infiltrate into the groundwater instead of going rushing into our water streams. And then uh, soil particles can help trap potential pollutants in the rainwater. The Brandywine is truly a community river. The sprawling estates, public parks, and small homes that line its banks connect two states to an artery of commerce critical to the national economy. As we approached Hagley Museum, we decided to reroute to a small opening to the left of the river, which became like a fast-moving log flume. As we re-established ourselves, we recognized the river's personality had changed. We bounced the red hull of the canoe off countless rocks and paddled furiously to keep from spinning broadside, putting us at risk of flipping. All in all, the team did well, but we knew it was not going to be easy to get home. We paddled around a bend approaching Alapocas Run State Park to find a 10-foot waterfall being used as a diving platform. I wouldn't say Team Brandy Man was a bunch of old men, but none of us were volunteering to join these daredevils. Alapocas Run State Park is truly incredible. The Brandywine River establishes the southern border of the park and creates a natural barrier separating the old mills and newly renovated townhomes. 190 years ago, a Quaker immigrant named John Bancroft bought 50 acres and half of the water rights here. By 1930, the mill was one of the largest cotton mills in the world. The Brandy Man was coming to a close. We floated toward the city of Wilmington, waving at joggers who had slipped out of the office to break a sweat and clear their heads. We were greeted on the river banks by Dan's neighbor and his big old Chesapeake Bay Retriever, Shotgun Willie. Willie made it quite clear he was upset to be left home while the Brandy men had explored the length of our great family river.